At the end of three months, what had their search revealed? Unfortunately, nothing. There was mention that they, in the log, that they'd steamed a little over 15,000 miles in total in this search, but no wreckage or anything was found at any of the islands they visited. During the late afternoon of the 26th of July 1909, the SS Warata is getting ready to sail. The ship had arrived in Durban, South Africa, just a day prior from Adelaide, before heading to Cape Town, and finally to its final destination, London. Since the distance between Durban and Cape Town is relatively short, the Warata is expected to reach the South African capital just three days later, on July 29th. But it never reached its destination. What seems to be a total and complete vanishing of the ship remains one of the most inexplicable nautical mysteries in history. The SS Warata was a passenger and cargo steamship built in 1908 for the Blue Anchor Line, a very famous British shipping company at the time, operating between the United Kingdom, South Africa and Australia between the 1870s and the 1910s. The owners of the company wanted the Warata to be an improved version of their existing steamer, the SS Geelong constructed in 1904, and therefore most systems, materials and specifications were based upon those of the Geelong. The vessel was laid down at Barclay in Whitinch and launched on September 12, 1908. The ship, due mostly for its long trips and high prices, was destined to the higher class people and designed specifically for luxury. In fact, it was structured in three separate decks. Lower, Main, and Spar. The first class accommodations built on the promenade could house 128 passengers. This vessel also had third class accommodations for more than 300 people, with the possibility to convert the cargo area into a passenger dormitory, adding roughly 600 passengers. The ship was also equipped with 16 lifeboats. Soon after its delivery, the SS Warata left the port of London on the 5th of November 1908 for its maiden trip to inaugurate its cross-Atlantic route to Australia. There were a total of 756 passengers on board, with 689 people in third class and 67 in first class, along with 154 crew members. The commander of the vessel was Captain Joshua Edward Ilbury, an extremely experienced sailor and commander of none other than the SS Geelong, little sister of the Warata. After leaving London, the ship briefly stopped at Cape Town. Before arriving at Adelaide on the 15th of December. Warta almost completed the first half of the maiden voyage, not without any problems though. In fact, while it was sailing for Adelaide on the 6th of December, a small fire erupted in the lower starboard bunker extending into a very dangerous place, the engine room. The fire was brought under control by noon of the same day, but kept reigniting up until the next day. The most likely cause of the fire was the lack of proper isolation of the steam valves inside the engine room, 
causing its uncontrolled heating. After this inconvenience, the ship continued sailing to Melbourne, Sydney, and finally sailing back to London, where it was inspected and underwent some minor repairs. The Warta successfully completed its maiden voyage. But Captain Ilbury was not completely satisfied with the state of the ship during the inspection. In fact, considering he was previously in charge of the Geelong, he reported to the owners of the newer Warta that the ship did not have the same stability as his old vessel had. This resulted in sending back the ship to a maintenance site for further inspections. About a month and a half after its arrival in London, the Warata was now ready to initiate its second voyage. This time the vessel was carrying 215 passengers along with 119 crew members and a large cargo of general merchandise. This first half of the trip was largely uneventful, briefly stopping by Cape Town on May 18, arriving at Adelaide on June 6, continuing to Melbourne, where the ship had to navigate through a gale which prolonged its trip by a few days. By June 26, the ship arrived at Sydney, loaded its fuel, cargo and some of its passengers and sailed to Melbourne and Adelaide to fully complete its boarding. Warta is ready to sail back to Europe. But unlike its maiden trip, the Warta had one more stop between Adelaide and Cape Town, the city of Durban, which had been reached by the Warta on the morning of the 25th of July. All passengers and crew were getting ready to get back on track and to head to Cape Town, apart from one passenger, an engineer and experienced sea traveler by the name of Claude Sawyer. Claude, in fact, decided to leave the ship as soon as he reached Durban, because he didn't feel that the ship, while they were crossing a storm, handled the winds and waves as it should. Subsequently, he sent the following message via telegraph to his wife. Thought Warta top heavy, landed Durban. Sawyer later claimed that he'd also been quite disturbed by some visions he saw during his dreams while he was resting on the ship. He stated to have seen a man dressed in a very peculiar dress which he had never seen before, with a long sword in his right hand, which he seemed to be holding between us. In the other hand, he had a rag covered with blood. Sawyer, understandably, took these visions as a sign to immediately abandon the ship as soon as he reached Durban, as I guess everyone would have done. This decision saved his life. The next day, the Warta sailed for Cape Town, about 800 nautical miles south, with 211 passengers and crew on board. At around 4 a.m., the Warta was spotted by another ship, the steamer Clan Messintyre. Since the Warta was a faster ship, cruising about 3 knots faster, it reached Clan Messintyre and both vessels communicated and exchanged signals by a signal lamp, other than exchanging information such as destination and name of the ship. The sighting took place close to the mouth of the Banshee River, located in the eastern part of South Africa. The Warta stayed inside of the Clan Messintyre until it disappeared over the horizon. This was the last confirmed sighting of the Warta.
Now, there were other people, both inside other ships and on the ground, that claimed to have seen the Warta, but these sightings are still unconfirmed to this day. During the evening of the 27th, the captain of a ship by the name of Harlow saw a large pile of dark smoke coming out of a steamer just above the horizon. A few hours later, when darkness fell, the captain could still see the steamer, but about 10 miles behind them, when suddenly two bright flashes could be seen in the direction of the smoking ship. Another crew member, though, thought that those flashes were actually caused by some bush fires on the coastline, very common during summer and in that location. Throughout the same evening, another ship by the name of Guelph, going the opposite direction of the water, exchanged light signals. But because of poor visibility due to bad weather, just three letters of its name, written on the side of the ship, were visible. The third most notorious sighting was by a South African rifleman, conducting a military exercise near the coastline. He saw through its binoculars a ship that resembled the shape and overall description of the Warta, southwest of its position, struggling against heavy seas, being rolled to starboard, and finally rolling inverted, vanishing below sea level. Since the Warata was considered unsinkable, just like her older sister, the Titanic, its disappearance at first did not cause much alarm. In fact, it was quite common that ships would arrive days or even weeks after their scheduled arrival, most of the time due to rough weather. People weren't even expecting any SOS call, since the ship was not equipped with an onboard radio. Therefore, it was not capable of communicating. The only way for the Warta to communicate to the shore and with other ships was with light signals. But when another ship did the exact same trip from Durban to Cape Town and did not report to have seen any signs of the Warta, then fear started to grow. Just four days after the disappearance of the vessel, the Royal Navy dispatched two cruisers to search for the Warta. But because of extreme bad weather, they had to return back to the shore along with numerous other rescue ships. On the 13th of August 1909, the captain of the steamer in Zitswa reported several sightings of possible dead bodies floating just above the surface of the ocean, in the vicinity of the mouth of the Banshee River very close to the approximate location of the last sightings of the Warata. These sightings though were discredited when later that day a tug sent out to recover the bodies didn't find any. What the crew of the Nzitswa had seen were probably the bodies of some dead skates, as reported by the crew of the tug floating on the surface of the water. In September 1909, the cargo ship Sabine started the biggest and the most expensive search yet for the Warta. It was equipped with powerful searchlights, making the search possible even at night time and enough lifeboats to rescue all the passengers. After having searched and zigzagged for more than 23,000 square kilometers, it found nothing but empty ocean. On December 15, 1909, after five months of the disappearance of the vessel, it was officially declared missing. During the 20th century though, more search efforts were made to try to find the missing wreck, thanks primarily to the efforts of the researcher Emmeline Brown. 
In 1999, newspapers reported that the wreckage of the Warta was found off the South African coast, more or less where the missing ship would have been. The image received by a sonar scan resembled exactly the dimensions of the Warta. In my mind, there, there's no doubt that it is the, the Warta. But having said that, I don't think there is one diagnostic feature yet that we've uh, we've encountered that um, says it is the Warata. There are a lot of uh, features, including its overall dimensions, etc., etc., that all add together um, to show that it, it is the Warata. These suggestions were, once again, confirmed to be false. The wreckage found was actually the one of the Nelsie Meadow, a cargo ship sunk by a German U-boat during the Second World War. After more than 20 years of efforts in finding the Warta, Brown gave up his search, quoting, I've exhausted all the options. I now have no idea where to look. The most likely reason why this ship disappeared without a trace is an encounter with a so-called freak wave, not uncommon in this region of the Indian Ocean. Since other ships sailing during the time of the accident in that area reported to have encountered rough weather, the hypothesis of rough sea could very well be the cause of the sinking. The vessel was already unstable when it arrived at Durban, so if they actually encountered the freak wave, well, it could have rolled over the ship on one side or worse, rolled it over completely, which would explain why we haven't found any bodies potentially trapped under the sinking ship. In the cargo holds of the Warata, there were more than 1,500 tons of leader concentrate, which, under certain circumstances, could turn into liquid form, caused by the continuous motion of the ship. The vessel could have been capsized by the free surface effect, hugely affecting the world's stability. Earlier we discussed about how a crew of a nearby ship, traveling the opposite direction, could have probably seen the world's on fire, followed by two large explosions. These explosions could have been a cause of a sudden rise in temperature in the coal bunkers of the ship. Although it seems highly unlikely that a ship the size of the Warta would sink this quickly without even sending any lifeboats. And most importantly, without leaving the sign of any wreckage. More than a century has passed since the vanishing of the Australian Titanic Warta, and the fact that we haven't found even a single piece of the ship, nor any bodies, is still considered a mystery to this day.